Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, where we talk about the real life events that happen, different news stories week to week, and the movies that have already been made that we think go along with all these different stories. So I'm your host, Mitch, and with me is our other host, Brad. Say hi, Brad. Hello. So since this is our first episode, let's start things off by discussing how this idea came to be. You know, you kind of came up with this initially, and we've been (laughs) fine tuning it now for a while, but, you know, we didn't really think there was anything like this out there in, in terms of covering this this mix of past week news stories and, you know, these movies that we think, you know, we went along with the life imitates art quote and just kind of ran with that and said, OK, we're going to find movies that have already been made that depict almost these these real life situations that are happening for the first time in real time. Yeah, man, it was it was uh, the the thought of just wanting to cover because talking about movies is something you and I we've known each other for a few years now and it's um we 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 would just talk about I mean we'd we'd launch into we worked in uh the for the uh, Bowie Bay Sox the double A team of the Orioles and so we'd be in the press box and we'd just be talking about movies for before the game started for for like an hour before the game started. And, I always thought it would be an interesting idea to kind of marry, just to sit and talk. Wow, I'm sucking at this, but just to sit and talk about um, talk about movies, man, because everybody likes talking about movies. And then there was the idea of like these past couple of years, there's been a lot of stuff happening in the news that has been stuff you never thought you'd live through, and then you watch movies and you realize, well the creative minds in Hollywood and movies have already done that stuff. It's already maybe not to the extent that it's in the actual real world right now, but we've touched upon most every topic in the over hundred year history of movies. So it was just a way to marry those two. You know, it's funny you say that because I was just thinking about that the other day where movies quote unquote have only been around for just about a hundred years at this point, this being 2021 now you know, movies and movies the way that we know them on the big screen, the way they're depicted, some of the earliest classics, you know, it's it's about a, a hundred years that movies have been around. So this is still like an evolving art form. And of course, you know, like you said, people have opinions about movies, people love talking about movies. So that's that's what we're gonna do here. You know, we we I think we're both alike in the way that we appreciate the classics as well as, you know, we really like some new movies that are made these days and the way that filmmaking has evolved. And we like just talking about all these different movies that are still coming out and about comparing them, comparing them to classics and just, you know, talking about them at length. Yeah, man. So then that becomes kind of the basis of what this podcast is, which is each week, we're just going to grab stories from the week and we're going to fit, you know, in reading these stories, you kind of in your head, you think about, oh, well, that kind of reminds me of this movie. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, okay. So it's like, you know, this thing that maybe seem unprecedented that you read on CNN or Fox News, depending on what you watch, or MSNBC, any of them, you know. And lots, like, of other, lots of other sources from around the web, too. You know, we're not just going to the same place every week, you know, looking for the same types of stories. You know, we really tr- we're going to try to to mix it up and talk about different topics and, you know, pull from right. different uh, places that – you know, people might not frequent if you're a big CNN reader, if you're a big Fox News reader that, you know, you get all your news from one source, like we're going to try to pull from a bunch of different sources. Right. And so each week, what we're going to do is we're going to have Mitch will pull in three stories that he found interesting for the week. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pull in three stories that I found interesting for the week. And to that point, just in this last week alone, we have five different news sources. You know, I I did have two from CNN, but <laughs> apart from that, we do have the rest of them are all from different news sources. So, yeah, we we scour the Internet. So the Mega Millions jackpot is now up to around seven hundred and fifty million dollars. And obviously there are a lot of people right now who could not only use at least a little bit of that money, but just that kind of money to kind of help them out with this ongoing pandemic and just everything else going on right now. So 
Um, this seven hundred and fifty million dollar jackpot. You know, what do you think about that? What's 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 the first thing that you would buy? It's it's an age old question. What would you buy first if you got that kind of lottery winnings? Yeah. Um, so the update is the Powerball was just picked yesterday, and still no new winner, which is insane. That that apparently there was a winner a five five number winner who didn't get the actual Powerball in San Jose, California. And they won two point seven million. So that 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 number's still going up, which the next drawing will be what Saturday, I think is the next drawing. So I, I might have to go buy a ticket today. Well what would I buy that uh, uh, let ahead. me cut you off for a second though, because you know I was gonna say a little bit later that they said in this article that the your odds of winning this mega millions jackpot, I'm not sure if the same equals for the Powerball, but your odds of winning it is one in 300 million, give or take. So, mm -hmm. I mean, go ahead and, and buy a ticket if you want, but I, I just wouldn't get your hopes up too much. No, but it's a, uh, it's that feeling of, you know, you're not going to win, but you bought it thinking you might. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a zero. They, yeah, in your gut, you're like, you're thinking, there's no chance I'm going to win this based off of those percentages. And then you're like, oh, I bought the ticket. I have, I'm, I got my, I got a chance. There's, there's that gut feeling of it could happen to me, which brings me to my movie, which is a title from 1994. Um. I just realized I didn't answer your question. We'll get to that. But it's a title from 1994. The segue was too perfect. Uh, a Nicolas Cage film called It Could Happen to You. Have you ever seen that one? I have not. I've heard of it, but I can't say that I've seen that particular one. I saw it a lot. I mean, I saw it when it first came out in 94, which was, I mean, it's basically just about Nick Cage as a cop. He goes into a, a diner. He uh, he can't he doesn't have enough money to leave a tip for the waitress uh, uh, Bridget Fonda, and so he says I can come back and I can give you double the tip I would have given you, or I can give you half of this ticket this lottery ticket if I win. He ends up winning six point two million dollars in that lottery, and he keeps his word. And you know then it's a romantic, and they fall in love and get married and everything. But that was so it's one of the so early early Nick Cage. So. I know you're a fan, but would you say that there is a bad Nicolas Cage movie out there? Because, you know, the guy's been in a lot of movies and, you know, he's made some not as great ones and some really good ones. But, you know, would you say that there's really a bad Nicolas Cage movie out there? You know, one that you should avoid and not watch that he's in. Off the top of my head, I can't think of one. I mean, he's done so many direct-to-video movies right now that I haven't seen them all, but the ones I have seen, I love. And that's, uh, that's uh, I'm looking at his IMDb right now. It's why my face is this way, but I'm trying to think if there is one where I'm just like, that's complete garbage. And there really isn't. I mean, maybe Ghost, Ghost the second Ghost Rider, I think, sucked. Yeah. But even that was, I can watch it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, and his direct to video movie. Have you seen some of his more recent ones? Like, he did one called Mom and Dad recently, where it's just about something in the air makes parents want to kill their children. It is insane and it is awesome. Which the, it almost kind of sounds like the happening, but with people, yeah, and not horrible. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, it does sound pretty <laughs> bad, but I mean, you know even if it if the movie is bad you know Nicolas Cage's performance you know especially when it's like a zany character it's not going to be bad dude commits man the dude commits did you speaking of Nicolas Cage I don't have you seen the new Netflix series the uh the art uh the, the history of swear words no I I know you you recommended that to me a little bit ago and I've yet to watch that it's it's sitting with the the pile of stuff that I have sitting in my Netflix queue but you know I will I will get to it at some point because it it does sound really entertaining so the the movie that I picked out for this one, you know, I kind of took this concept of if you're given a lot of money in a very short amount of time, almost like you you win it, like it's granted to you. So my movie, I think it's interesting, and it's Mr. Deeds. So this is, 
I think people would argue that this is maybe one of the last decent comedies that Adam Sandler's made. And he's kind of had a resurgence in recent years. He's, he's done some stuff with Netflix to varying degrees of success. And he's had um, an acclaimed performance in Uncut Gems. But would you say that this is around the time, the last time that we saw a decent Adam Sandler comedy was with Mr. Deeds? So yeah, Mr. Deeds was around the time I think like his his box office maybe started dwindling a little bit. But I still like some of his other movies that came after that. Like like he did um, That's My Boy, which was an R-rated flick that came after that, which I found hilarious. And um, and uh, after that, you know, he did uh, the Grown Up movies. They're okay, actually. The Grown Up movies were his like biggest box office hit. So, but. His Netflix movies, I agree, have not been great. Although I, I loved Hubie Halloween. I don't know if you saw that his latest one. I, I really enjoyed that one. That's why I say I set up top where he's kind of had a little bit of recent success because Hubie Halloween has gotten him kind of back in the spotlight a little bit. Not like he ever really left, but I would say back in the good spotlight because people seem to like that one. There are some people that don't really like it. I haven't seen it yet because I've been really wary of all his recent movies because he just hasn't really had that many good ones but so maybe maybe by word of mouth maybe i'll check it out eventually but no i haven't seen qb halloween yet i would say if you haven't watched it wait till halloween time because it is it, it, it it's it reminded me of like hocus pocus where it's like it feels like a it feels like halloween so I'd say wait, wait till Halloween time, and then and then throw that on your your Halloween mixtape. Yeah. But like you mentioned, Uncut Gems, dude. Uncut, he got, dude should have been nominated for an Oscar for Uncut Gems. Phenomenal movie, and phenomenal performance. So he should have been nominated. Is this the the first time that the Academy got a, a nomination wrong? It is. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, well, I mean, he should have been nominated several. He should have been nominated for Punch Drunk Love. He should have been nominated for the Meyerowitz stories. And even going back to not him, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey should have been nominated and won for both Truman Show and Man on the Moon. So Still not over that. No, I will never be over that. Truman Show is like one of my all-time favorites, man. <laughs> so going back to Mr. Deeds, what, what do you like or don't like about this movie? Cause you know, while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you what I like. I like the concept because it's a, it's a different kind of environment for Adam Sandler to kind of have a comedic approach. Like, you know, he's an overnight billionaire. He's in a totally different kind of setting and scenario that his other movies has, have been in. And I think there are some good jokes. There are some good laughs in this still. I think, like other kind of Adam Sandler comedies before and after parts of it kind of fall flat and it's not really funny, but, or it doesn't hold up. Like if you go back and watch it in 2021 where it doesn't really have the same punch or effect as it did when you first saw it. But I think it's still, it's a decent comedy overall. I think. I am, I am a Adam Sandler fan uh, to the end. I love Adam Sandler. So I, even the worst Adam Sandler movie, I can still watch over and over again, and I'll watch it blocks. Um, so, Mr. D, Mr. Deeds, I like man. I, you got Steve Buscemi coming in with his crazy eyes, and I like. I always, I always like seeing Buscemi in all the Sandler's movies. Um, it had the heartfelt thing, you know. He was the, uh, he was the, he was trying to get his Hallmark card published, and then you know you get to the end, and he gets his Hallmark card published. Did you know that it's a remake of? A 1936 film, Mr. Deeds Goes to the Town, Frank Capra. I did, actually. So, you know, it, it kind of goes with a little bit of what we were talking about up top, where there's not really that many orig original ideas in Hollywood anymore because, you know, we've already imitated everything in real life. And that kind of ties into this where, you know, you could argue that everything these days is a reboot or a remake. You know, it could, and I'm sure that 1930s Mr. Deeds could trace its root back, roots back to a different story or a different medium or TV show or movie that was aired before it. You know, everything kind of branches from something else. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, Adam Sandler movies I like, and I like, I think, yeah, Murder Mystery was another Netflix one that was not great but not bad. And I think they're going to make a sequel actually. So, yeah. 
It's I'm a shame Adam because it's a shame because when they kind of first announced this deal between Netflix and Adam Sandler back um whatever year it was 2013 2014 somewhere around there and it almost kind of had you excited because it was this new kind of partnership and you thought okay you know we're going to get some good different kind of Adam Sandler movies you know he's going to make some funny movies and the first one to come out was the uh the western that he was in with uh you know the ensemble cast um you know i can't even remember the name of it off the top of my head ridiculous six yeah and that one just uh bombed you know and it was just not a hit at all not what they wanted with the the first one of those not the best but i think netflix around i don't know a few years ago they put out the uh the numbers of people who have watched the adam sandler numbers and so he's like the most watched person on netflix's thing so i it might not have been a hit to us, but I think to Netflix, that's been a pretty good partnership for them, especially because I, I think they just re-upped and he he's, he's keeps knocking them out, man. And I think it's Sandler movies, because a lot of them were directed by this one guy named Dennis Dugan, who is, he he does most of the, uh, he's, he has cameos in a lot of his movies too. So a lot of those movies were directed by Dennis Dugan. And he has the same kind of, um, circle of people who he direct who direct his movie is steve was it steve steven brill dennis dugan uh those guys so uh they 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 do tend to have the same type of humor in them but you know what sometimes you just want to sit down and watch a dumb no brain comedy that has some fart jokes in it i'll appreciate those till the day i die to each their own. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to my first story, which is a CNN story, but it's a sports story. So it's about just a simple story about the Browns and the plan, the, uh, the playing the Steelers in the first round of the playoffs this year. And so I got that story we we had exchanged stories. I come. I had that story prior to actually this past week's game, where the Browns actually ended up uh, essentially putting a spanking on the Steelers, which I'm a fan of because I'd take the Browns over the Steelers any day. So, which was uh, it was a good game, man. It was a good game, especially because the Steelers all season they were they were like eleven and zero, right? And then they just slid, and so a lot of people were calling them a fake 11 and 0 team. You remember those stories? Yeah, at the time, they were the only undefeated team in the NFL at 11 and 0, but people were still calling them one of the weakest undefeated teams at that point in the season ever because they they just didn't look as strong as some of these other undefeated teams in the past where they were rolling opponents where they were crushing people and they were you know, easily winning games with a all-star squad of players. This just, they just didn't really look like that sort of team, even when they were still undefeated. Yeah. So, so to go off on the sports tangent, do you think Roethlisberger is done? I think um, that's a question that can apply to a lot of, a lot of quarterbacks this year in the NFL. Roethlisberger specifically, I don't think he's done. I, I think it's going to be another maybe one or two years. I don't think he'll want to go out like this. I don't know anyone who does. And I think it would have been it would have been more of a saga, you know, the media and him and really kind of setting the stage if this was his last season going in, which it didn't really feel like to me. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I definitely agree with the uh... – Pride will take over and say, I'm not, I'm not letting my career end like that. But so this story was really about that game, about the Browns. And the reason I picked that story was because it's a movie I watch every year on the day it happens. Oh, no. I see that shake. Did you pick oh, the same yeah, movie? I, I know. I know what you're going to say. Oh, yeah. That movie's called Draft Day. Because mm-hmm. that movie is. I watch. I literally watch it every year on draft day since it came out in a couple of years ago, 2017, I think it was. Maybe it might have been before that, but um, I watch it every year on draft day. I love it. I can. I watch it. I can watch it over and over again. I, I love Kevin Costner. I love Jennifer Garner, and uh, 
that's just a great movie and it's about the Cleveland Browns and and how they handle their draft day and they end up with a phenomenal draft day and so that's that's my movie man what would you think about draft day so I've never seen it but with that in mind I have to ask you cuz I'm sure I would like it as both a movie fan and a sports fan because it seems it seems pretty decent from what I've kind of heard people say about it but so my question is would you recommend it to a a movie fan just you know someone who likes to watch new movies and then B as a sports movie fan would you recommend it to that type of crowd as well So yeah, I would. Sports fan, it's not so much a sports movie. It's a sports movie in as much as like a money ball is a sports movie. It deals more with the inside workings of it. You're not getting a lot of on field. Actually, in that movie, you're not getting any on field play. So it's 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 more of like a behind the scenes how things work. And it's a it's a kind of a fantasy of how things work on draft day too, because the way that movie ended up is well, I guess people compared it to the uh the way the Redskins got Robert Griffin and, and they had to give up all the draft picks and everything to get it and everything. But, you know, the way that movie ends up is definitely a fantasy. But it didn't get great reviews upon release. didn't do great in theaters. It's an Ivan Reitman movie, you know, the legend who did Ghostbusters and produced Animal House. And, um, you know, I, I gauge general interest on how my – my mom likes a movie or how like my friends like a movie because they're not they're not into movies the way I am or you are and my mom enjoys the movie and uh my friends enjoy the movie so I think it's one of those movies that it's not the best movie ever made it's not the worst movie ever made just a solid way to spend two hours so you would almost kind of say that like your mom is like an average movie moviegoer. She she doesn't mm-hmm. kind of obsess over movies. She just kind of sees what's out, and you know she either gives it a, a thumbs up or thumbs down. It's not it's not an in depth discussion. And you said you know your mom liked this one. She did, and to 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 relate that to you, my mom also hates Blair Witch. Mitch hates Blair Witch so much. But my yeah. mom, I joke around that with my mom all the time. She hated Blair Witch. Uh, I'm not a, a fan of the Blair Witch Project for anyone who knows me. <laughs> but yeah, it's I it, I generally gauge, and that's how I gauge popularity of celebrities too. Where I, I think about like my friends who are just they're just normal people. I'm like, does my friend know who Gary Cooper is? Does my friend know who you know Vincent Price is? And it's like I do. Do they? I don't know. So with the movie I picked out for this one, I took a little bit of a different approach. Uh, in the article, it mentions how the last time the Browns won a playoff game was in 1994, which is a long time ago. So I kind of did what ESPN and some of these other kind of sports stations show during a game where something like this happens. It's been a long time and they show, oh, OK, the year was 1994. This artist was at the top of the charts. You know, this was happening in the world just to get a sense of, you know, the time period. So. I took a movie from 1994, and it's one of my favorites ever, my favorite animated film of all time, The Lion King. And this is one that, you know, you can't say enough good things about. And I would say the opposite could be said about its recent remake, the the live action Lion King. But I just... The animation, just the, the soundtrack, the the acting, the story, the amazing score by Hans Zimmer, it just like it just all comes together so perfectly. And I'm not saying it's a flawless movie, but it is a, a very good one and, and has a, a special place in my heart and I just I, I could watch it over and over again. I do love Lion King, so I'll give a little story about when the Lion King was in theaters was I, it's I remember it, so that means it was a memorable event. But I, it's a simple thing. Was I remember Lion King had come out, and Disney was doing a double feature in theaters of Lion King and Angels in the Outfield, and my mom and dad and me were going to go see this double feature, and um, we got to the theater and it was sold out, and so my dad was just like, "All right," he's like, "All right, champ," but uh, he, he said, uh, "He said." Uh, do you want to wait till tomorrow? Cause it was a two night event thing. Do you want to wait till tomorrow to go see this double feature? Or do you want to go? There was one of those, I don't, I don't even know if they're still around 
do you remember second run theaters? So second, no, mm, no, I you might be too so. young. So to give a little history, I think we have a nine year age difference between the two of us. So yes. some of our references, I might something like that. So it's around nine, nine, maybe 10 years. I was born in 84. You, what year were you born? 92. 90 what? 92. Oh, 92. Okay. So not, so eight years. Okay. So we have a little bit, but so, so, um, we, a second run theater was, uh, you know, back in the day, movies used to take six, seven months before they would go from theaters to video. Mm-hmm. Back in, back in the day, my father was good friends with a guy who owned a video store. So when movies first came out, they would cost like $90 for just one VHS. And then what would happen was someone would have them they call sell through and then the title would be available to buy and everything. So second run theater was after like a month or two of a movie being in theaters, it would go to a second run theater where the tickets would be like three bucks. And it wasn't as nice of a theater, but you know, it was, it was, it was a good place to go. If you waited to go see a movie, you could have a nice night out. So that night, my dad said, we can wait till tomorrow to come back and see this double feature, or you just want to go to the second room theater. It's right around the corner, and we'll go see a movie. And I said, you know what? We're out. Let's go see the second room. And so that night, my mom, dad, and I went and saw uh, Getting Even with Dad, the Macaulay Cole conflict. And it's just a story. really has nothing to do with Lion King other than that was one of the movies. But it's just always, that's one of those, those happy childhood memories I have. I appreciated the remake for what it was, but it really wasn't. It was like... It, to me, it reminded me a bit of um, Psycho. You remember the remake of Psycho, which was a shot-for-shot remake of the original? Yeah. And at that point, you're just like, I'll just watch the original. And that's kind of what this one felt like to me, where it was just like, yeah, I'll just I'll watch the original. I, I enjoyed it for what it was, and I love John Favreau, but I'll just watch the original. Yeah, I think I think John Favreau did the best he could with this one. It's just some of the main problems for me were, you know, when you're doing it with with real animals, and I say real like when people say it's not really live action. Well, what do you expect? Do you expect them to get lions to talk and act out different scenes? Like you, you can't do that. So this is as real as we're gonna get. So let's just call it the live action Lion King. But I think the problem with it is with these animals, you can't get them to show as much emotion as you can animated. It's just, it's a problem for emotional scenes and just delivering lines that you're hearing these, these animals and seeing them, you know, flap their lips, but it doesn't really come across that emotional. And then also it's just not, you know, the setting, it's just, it's not as bright and colorful and vibrant as the original, as the animated one, because again, it's based off of real life and, you know, they can't put all these bright colors in there. It, it would seem out of place. You know, it wouldn't look as, as real, like a real landscape. And look, it still looks great just in a generic sense, just in terms of their shots and their landscapes in it. But it's just not as as bright and colorful and just as overall just a joy to kind of watch as, as the original. So the next story up here is... This week, Kevin Feige kind of went around and did press for WandaVision and kind of elaborated on some of the other projects in the works, the different Marvel movies and TV shows. And as of this recording, as of today, Friday, um, you know, WandaVision just had its first two episodes. And I will say I did watch them this morning. No spoilers, of course, but... um, you know, what do you think about this whole model that Marvel has brewing with all these different projects and they're coming out in their different ways and different orders, you know, the the TV shows versus the movies? Do you think, A, that this structure is a good idea that it'll hold up over time? Or is it going to be, be overly saturated and people are going to get sick of Marvel stuff because there's going to be so much coming out in the next few years? Yeah, I think um, I think that's gonna. It's gonna be hard to keep up with this stuff now because when it came to the movies, I knew usually two movies a year. I'd go see them in theaters. I'd enjoy them. I'm not a comic book reader, so I appreciated the movies and their storytelling. Now it's going. Now I have to subscribe to Disney Plus because these stories are going to be in between the movies. These are all connected to the movies yeah. with these. 
shows are they well, one are they one-off shows or are they continuing shows that uh, do you know that answer or no that's kind of a question people are asking right now if there's going to be since this is the first disney plus marvel show to come out this wandavision and originally it was supposed to be the falcon and winter soldier but that had some production problems due to coronavirus so they kind of switched it up and now wandavision is this first disney plus marvel show and that's the question that people are asking right now if it's going to be this kind of one-off series of events and the chronology of the tv shows and movies is going to stay intact or if they're going to have a season two of this and I think, and I really hope it's it, it's going to be the first one where it's just going to kind of be a one-off. It's going to be a, a show, almost kind of like a, a longer movie. It's going to be a series of events that happens. And you see the characters in this show kind of play out in, in different movies and kind of move their, their stories along over there. Yeah. And, and so I can appreciate that. I can appreciate... The, the the telling of these stories because honestly the story the move the the stories they're picking sound good i mean wandavision looks good i plan on watching it tonight but mm -hmm. that's another issue marvel movies now could potentially fall i mean disney plus is a pretty popular it's one of the streaming services that's going to make it because i think a lot of people have subscribed to it they have a lot of good content so so but the people who don't maybe are they going to feel lost come future movies and they're not going to go see these movies because, Oh, I didn't watch WandaVision. So I don't, I don't know what's going on in Avengers six and stuff. So, and another, the big issue I have with streaming services as a whole right now is as you can see, massive collector of physical media, these streaming services do not release their stuff on DVD or mm -hmm. DVDs old, the Blu-ray 4k. They're not releasing. It. And so, up there that point right there that's all my marvel movies that's my superhero collection right there and i so i have all the marvel movies got them in sweet steel book packaging and um now my marvel collection i have them all from mm -hmm. from iron man through avengers endgame own mm -hmm. them all now my collection is going to be incomplete because disney plus probably isn't going to release it on blu-ray that just annoys me that they don't release physical media of these movies on on, on streaming services and, and then it's also just time, hours in the day. I'm going to now have to watch so much stuff, so much stuff out there now that it's, I can't, you can't possibly watch it all, you know? So do I think that well, they, they maintained quality for 20 for 23 movies, 22 movies. Will the quality go down eventually? It may dip, but it's kind of like Pixar. Pixar dipped. They did a movie called Brave, which I hated, but they just made Soul, which I think is like one of the best movies of the year. So, you know, I think quality will dip. Marvel did dip a little bit. I didn't really enjoy Captain Marvel that much. So, I think this is... They ha they're good at hiring people. They hire the right people to make their movies. Yeah. So, we'll see. That was a long-winded answer of we'll see. <laughs> So uh, the movie that I picked for this one, obviously it's a Marvel movie and kind of tying into this recent kind of entry into this universe with WandaVision, I picked Inve Avengers Infinity War. And the reason I picked this one is because obviously almost every character is in this one. So you could say this movie applies to any character if you wanted to talk about any of the, the Marvel superheroes. But obviously the events in this movie kind of affect everybody and it kind of carries over a little bit into the series, obviously like these, these two big movies, infinity war and Endgame. you know, the characters are going to be talking about them for years, you know, and all these different shows and, and movies and things, the effects of the events that happened, how they affected the characters. We're still going to be dealing with that for, you know, the time being, but when it comes down to it because and the re another reason i picked infinity war is because this was a debate that was going on online this week where people were debating about which was better endgame or infinity war and honestly i like endgame more overall i think it just has a lot more entertainment value but as a movie i gotta say infinity war is probably the better one for me because 
Um, you know, it has stakes. It has all these different kind of pieces that are coming together. It's, you know, it's a huge scale like event movie and really left, you know, an impression on people that walked out of it seeing it in theaters when it initially came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a tough one between which one's better because I guess the difference was the shock ending in both of them, you knew was, you knew kind, kind of, well, let me rephrase it. I'm trying to say. So in the in Infinity War, you get to the end, the snap, everybody's dissipating, and you're and it was a, a shock that it happened. Right, and but even you, though these are recent movies, you know we, we try not to do spoilers for for really recent stuff. But come on, if you don't know what happens in Infinity War and Endgame by now, but you're gonna be mad about finding out, but you haven't seen them yet, like you know that's that's on you at this point. Yeah, I'm gonna say that's all. And Bruce Willis is a ghost in the sixth sense. So, <laughs> with so yeah, Infinity War, you get to the snap. I'd say we should have what a, a one year moratorium. If it came out within a year, that's the moratorium I'll give you. If you have, but after that, you're on your own. But um, so the snap came. But when you when you were at the theater, or when you when you left the theater and you were di digesting what you saw, you kind of just were like, oh. Well, we already know Spider-Man's making a movie. We know he's coming back. We know all these people are coming back, how they come back. But so it was a phenomenal in the movie where you're like, Oh wow. And it was cool because there was no music in that scene too. If you remember, it was just yeah. wind, which was really well done. And, um, but you knew they were coming back. You knew most of them were coming back. Didn't they all come back? And then with that end game, you knew they said, Oh, the ending, but you kind of knew, Tony Stark was was leaving. You knew you knew Downey Jr. was was going to be done for, so you knew he was more than likely going to die. The way they did it, for now, I mean that that funeral scene, such a well done scene. So you're then the, you're talking about the the funeral scene in Endgame where you have everybody kind of in their their black attire towards the end of the movie for uh, Iron Man's funeral. Yeah, and the camera just weaves mm -hmm. through them, dude. It was such a great scene. Yeah, yeah I, I uh. Infinity War and all those, but I, I'll give my movie now too, just because it, I, the movie I picked was Iron Man because I figured if it's a story about Marvel and how big they are now, go back to the beginning, the yeah. movie that launched it all, and so it just kind of weaves into this whole Marvel conversation we're having. That's why I kind of just threw it in. So Iron Man, if you saw that in theaters at the time when it came out and somebody kind of told you what it would launch and what would happen down the line this this universe that it was that it would spawn you know what what would you say to somebody like that who told you about what iron man would inspire back then so full disclosure i was lucky enough to see a sneak preview of iron man before it was released in theaters nice. and the original version the sneak preview version did not have the tag at the end with mm -hmm. uh with sam jackson mm -hmm. So it wasn't so when you saw it in theaters, you're just like, that was good. That was an awesome movie. It wasn't until the movie came out and was released that you're like, oh snap, something bigger's going on here. Like I said, I'm not a comic book guy, so I didn't I I didn't know what the Avengers were. I knew none of this stuff. So And the, even if the, you did, you know, there there's no way to tell even not not even to where we are now, but even back then, there's no way to tell what was going to happen with the first Avengers movie, you know, all the stuff kind of leading up to that. And then at the time, you know, people were blown away by the first Avengers movie. There's no way to even kind of tell that from Iron Man, from that post credit scene with Samuel L. Jackson in the first one. And I think that just goes back to what we were talking about, where they're just Feige is good at hiring talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that guy, he should, he he potentially and probably did change movies because interconnected universes 22 films connected that hasn't been done before and now you're starting to see that pop maybe not 22 movies but i will give a shout out to one of my idols kevin smith did have the view universe where he connected all of his movies back in the day so kevin feige stole that from kevin smith but um but if I, I mean, he really, 
change. I, I think, you know, the Oscars sometimes give a, a special Oscar. They haven't done it in a while, I think, but I remember they gave it to Who, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. They were just like, this movie's too groundbreaking. We, we got to give it an Oscar for that. And so I, I think Kevin Feige should deserve recognition for what he has done. And, and um, you have the detractors. Remember, what was it last year? Martin Scorsese said that Marvel movies are like amusement park rides. They're not movies. Love Martin Scorsese disagree they're great movies yeah so with iron man it was the first it was a character that isn't really popular you know i like i don't i didn't know much about iron man you had robert downey jr who was not a bankable star back then if you if you remember his past he was pretty far from bankable and then you have the aforementioned john favreau who um who was coming off of elf and coming off of what was it zathura and then he had written Swingers, and I think he directed Made. So he didn't have a huge resume yet. And so they took a chance on him, and it was Favreau who pushed for uh, for uh, uh, Downey Jr. to get, get cast in the role. And it just became a massive hit. I mean, you can bank 20, what is it, 20 billion dollars in box office or something around that figure of box office revenue on the shoulders of John Favreau and Kevin Feige because without Iron Man, if Iron Man comes out and does 60 million domestic, we don't have the behemoth of Marvel that we have today. No, absolutely not. All right. So let's move on. Next story. I got my second CNN story, if you will. But, um, last week there was a, a, um, a jailbreak in California. Six inmates uh, escaped from a California jail by, you know, you'd think we'd have more sophisticated ways to get out of prison now, but nope, they just tied together bed sheets and climbed out. Um, update on the story as of today, three of the six have been captured. So three of them are still on the loose, which isn't good. Hopefully they can get caught soon. Um, just in prison breaks, they're, I don't know, they're interesting. I mean, there's a lot of movies that deal with prison breaks and I'll just already launch. Well, first, yeah, yeah. First, before I launch into the movie, how do you, what's your opinions on these, on a prison break? It's, it's, it's very movie-esque, just the story. It really is. And you're right where there's a lot of movies about prison breaks. And we'll get to that in a second with what we picked to kind of go along with this. But, you know, when you sent this article over to me, I was really surprised as well. I, th I read about it and I was expecting some kind of elaborate scheme or, you know, a, a glitch in the system that they somehow capitalized on to escape. And really, it just sounds like they just made a, a homemade rope and went up to the, the ceiling of the prison and just and just got out. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have I don't even know what to say, man, other than. It, they, hopefully they catch them soon. I mean, they caught three of them. Hopefully three more come in. But with movies, I just went with the most famous prison break movie of all time. I'm wondering. I, I have a feeling that we picked the same movie, but maybe not. But the most no, the most famous prison break movie of all time is The Shawshank Redemption. Yep. And it's. Uh, man, I'm, I don't even know how many people know. I'm sure you do, but do people fully know that that's a Stephen King story? Probably not because, you know, and me, and me too, when I think Stephen King, I think horror. So, you know, maybe not that many people are aware that it's a Stephen King story. I'm sure there are definitely people that are, but no, I wouldn't, if you asked me Stephen King movies, start naming some, that would not be the first one that came to my mind. Yeah. So, yeah, it was originally a short story it was Rita Hayworth in the Shawshank Redemption. I believe that's the title. It was Rita Hayworth in the Shawshank Redemption. And it's all about because the poster Andy Dufresne uses to cover up his massive hole is a picture, is a poster of Rita Hayworth, a movie actress from the 20s or 30s from back in the day. So, and I, yeah, it's, I haven't seen it in a while, but I, it still ranks as one of the all time greatest movies on like IMDb and, and all those places. And, Tim Robbins, Morgan Freeman, two of my favorite actors. I don't think people can 
not really a bad word you can say about it either. Those guys are they're just phenomenal. And yeah, just a great movie. When was the last time you seen it, if you remember? So I- don't yeah, don't don't get upset at me, but I, I actually have never seen it. But this is one of those ones that has been kind of sitting on my list for years where look, I'm I'm going to watch it eventually. It's one of those classics that everybody has to see that I haven't seen yet. And there really aren't that many. You know, I've seen a lot of the movies that if you put together a list of movies that everyone has to see, this might be on it. And, you know, there aren't that many that I haven't seen like that. The Godfather is another one of those. I will watch that one eventually too, but I have not seen the Shawshank Redemption. But obviously when you're talking about a prison break, this is the the go-to movie. But, you know, I will... I will watch it someday. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess the whole the whole topic we just covered is a giant spoiler alert for you. So <laughs> it's it's a it, it was made in the the nineties, I think. So I, you know the the spoilers already been spoiled for me. I I know how he escapes, and for people that didn't, you know, again, that's kind of on you since it's such an old movie at this point. But you know, <laughs> you kind of talked about it a little bit already, but. So I would still, of course, watch it, not just, you know, for, you know, unspoiling purposes, but just, you know, because it's a great movie, you know, and people have nothing but nice things to say about it. And I'm, I'm sure I will like it when I do finally sit down and watch it. Yeah, you should. You should definitely, definitely throw that one at the top of your heap. Mm-hmm. But now, so now I'm curious, what, I mean, what was your pick? When I picked my movie out, obviously Shawshank was the easy choice, and that was like you know the most logical choice too. But for mine, I did it a little bit differently, where I kind of thought about a movie where the protagonist has to escape from a prison-like environment, and for that one, I picked Room, which is a which is a great little movie with Brie Larson and Jacob Tremblay, and obviously a few other people as well, but they're the ones that really stand out in this. And it's just, it's such an emotional, like a a well-crafted movie. And the first time I I saw it, it it was just, you know, it kind of like blew me away. And it's made by the studio A24, which if you don't know them, they just churn out such high quality, just great, well-made movies. And If you look up the movies that they've made, you'll find that a lot of ones that you really like and are really good, highly rated and nominated movies kind of came from them, from their studio. But Room is just very good. It's just a story about escaping their environment. And then I won't, it's it's not super new, but I won't really say kind of all the stuff that happens after they, you know, try and escape their environment that they're, that they find themselves in initially, but it's just a very well-made, you know, almost like a small-scale movie for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Room. Room isn't a movie I'd normally go out of my way to see. I mean, it was, but uh, so I'm lucky enough to be a member of uh, Screen Actors Guild, and so when movies like that are nominated, they send us screeners, and so I did watch that and i did end up voting for brie larson that year because she was good man she's really good in that movie and jacob tremblay has turned out to be a really good actor i mean he was think about his performance in that and then go with good boys (laughs) he had like the the breadth of what that kid can do yeah so and he was in uh wonder as well phenomenal wonder so that kid's really good and yeah i mean that's a that's a tough movie to watch because Around that time was, I think that was the time where those, where the story came out about those women in Cleveland who were yeah. kidnapped in the basement for, I mean, years and years and years. And, and so you really, uh, it, it never been kidnapped, never, could never imagine what a person who is kidnapped goes through. And that movie was, it's a, it's one of those movies where it's good but I don't know how often I'm going to watch it because it's a tough movie to watch. It's kind of like if you've ever seen Fruitvale Station. 
yeah, it is it's, a phenomenal movie. It's very, I, it's very emotionally draining. It, 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 it deals with some heavy material, but it deals with you know really human stuff, and it, and it's not something you're gonna just play in the background over and over again while you're just hanging out for the day. But it just, it, it's still such a good watch, you know. Again, occasionally, and just as a side note here, Room is not to be confused with the movie The Room. <laughs> which is one of the best worst movies of all time with Tommy Wiseau. So just just to clarify, this is just Room with Brie Larson and Jacob Tremblay, among others. But just wanted to put that out there. But yes, it's it's a very emotional, very trying movie. But if you if you can bring yourself to watch it, it's it's definitely worth worth checking out. It's just difficult. There are movies that you watch that you watch because they give you a perspective of something you couldn't possibly it's a vast difference from a marvel movie right. where, you know i mean this is a movie where people have lived that and they have that 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 is part of them and that's a big part of the movie is you know dealing with the aftermath the family has to deal with the aftermath of how do you how do you deal with somebody like that who is life lifetime scarred from that and so yeah brie larson uh, she deserved the oscar that year she was good and i like brie larson she i've always liked seeing her she was in 21 jump street she was in train wreck she's always been one of those actresses that you're like i like seeing her and then she takes that on she gets the lead and you're like damn she's good yeah for the people that say she's not a good actress or the people that really only saw her in captain marvel and they don't really know anything else that she's in you know those kind of people like that I would point them to Room and say, go watch this and then tell me that Brie Larson is a bad actress. Right. Yeah, and I I did, when we were talking about Marvel, I did say I didn't really like Captain Marvel, and I still stand by that. I, I cannot like the actual movie, but like the actress and like everybody involved, just didn't feel like that one, that one landed for me. But Brie Larson, man, she's good. So my last story that I pulled here from the week deals with the COVID vaccine being distributed in the near future here from different major league ballparks around the stadium. And that includes, but probably won't be limited to city field, Yankee stadium and Dodger stadium. So these big hubs where people are probably going to be coming in, in waves to get their COVID vaccines. Once it kind of hits the general public a little bit more, and it's not just going to the, essential personnel as it is now the people that that need it first so you know hopefully that comes sooner rather than later because i'm sure we'd all like to to get back to regular life and you know try and kind of put this pandemic behind us but um so let's just get right into the movie because um you know the article is pretty self-explanatory and it's you know kind of maybe laying out a couple of details about plans but you know the headline kind of says it all so the movie that I went with is one that has been surging in popularity since the start of the pandemic. And it's one that I've been trying to get you and both my girlfriend to, to watch as well. And it's Contagion. And this one is very much based in the science and reflects what has been going on since about March around the world, March of 2020. And it reflects what we've been going through because they did their homework on this one. This movie was made in 2011 and they have really, it's like looking in a mirror with all the terminology in the movie and the sequence of events and people doing different things. It's really just kind of playing out the events that we've been going through in real life, but in a movie because they really did their homework with this one. And, you know, with its research and popularity, one of the writers for the film kind of came out, you know, who was being interviewed and said, look, it's frustrating to see everything that's going on because if they would just, if people just paid attention to the science that's being, you know, distributed and talked about these days, then we can kind of get back to real life a lot sooner because they really delved into the science of a possible pandemic in this movie back in 2011 and kind of predicted the future with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have mentioned Contagion a few times. I, I, I would say I, I remember when it first came out, and I remember I am a uh, – <laughs> I always get the word mixed up. 
because I have said uh, hypochondriac, I guess. Mm -hmm. See, I, in the doctor's office once before, I said, yeah, I'm a bit of a necrophiliac. And that, <laughs> that, that had a laugh. That one got a good laugh. But hypochond I always get those mixed up, which I probably shouldn't. But yeah, hypochondriac. And, and um, that movie came out and I actively said, even though I love you know Matt Damon, I love Steven Soderbergh and 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 and, and Gwyneth Paltrow. I I was like I just I don't want to see this movie because it's gonna mess me up. It's gonna mess up my brain. I will never go out again. I'll never go to a movie theater again. I'll never do anything again. I mean, little did I know, seven years later, I wouldn't be able to do that crap anyway. But um, so I actively didn't see it. And then when the coronavirus started, you know, you start watching movies, and then I I went back and I didn't watch Contagion. I watched Outbreak. Because Outbreak I had seen before. I'd seen that when it first came out. So an Outbreak is another, you know, it's another movie exactly like that. I mean, they specifically have a scene in Outbreak where a, a woman is in the back of a movie theater and she sneezes and they show them the the disease going through the air and people ha 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 laughing and <laughs> the disease is getting sucked up into them. So yeah, I I may watch Contagion one day. I'm, when coronavirus i'm vaccinated because i can't wait to get vaccinated so i can just go hang out with friends and we can do this in person um yeah that's but, true um, so yeah this, this I, is the whole reason why we're doing this format for this podcast is because um you know neither one of us really wants to risk the health of the other so you know until we can kind of figure out maybe get vaccinated or figure out a, a foolproof situation where we can film this podcast in person this is how we're going to do it over zoom and kind of go from there because you know we really don't want to because it's not worth the risk right now you know however careful we are things can happen and that's why we're kind of doing this format right now over zoom instead of because we both want to film in person we both want to take advantage of doing something like that but but we just can't right now so you know until we kind of figure that out or we get our vaccines this is how we're we're going to be doing it yeah man i'm a i'm a diabetic which i'm sure you couldn't tell by looking at me um but i am a diabetic so the prospect of going out which diabetes is like the underlying cause that's killing people apparently so i have been hold up luckily i have work that i can do at my computer i don't have to leave the house for it so it's been uh but i haven't with the exception of i went to target once right before christmas i haven't really left my house to do any i go i go to the mailbox it's my it's my big my big activity of the day i walk my dog too but even walking my dog man if there's somebody like walking on the path in front of me i like i like have to go like this because i don't want to breathe in Oh yeah, yeah, we're we're taking coronavirus. <laughs> so I will say that I I will still recommend this movie that you should watch this because again, like they they just nailed the science with this one, and it's less about them predicting the future and just knowing what would happen because they did their research and they talked to experts. And there's really nothing to fear, even if you're a hypochondriac watching this, because. Like I said, this movie just closely, so closely resembles real life, what has already been happening and what will happen because, and the reason I picked it is because in the movie they have at the end, when they're distributing the vaccines, it's in sports stadiums where they have large groups of people coming in, in lines to, to get their vaccines. So I will still recommend this movie that you watch. It's still, it's still very good and very accurate. This one... I had to rack my brain thinking of a movie for this one because I was trying to think of a movie that there's so many military movies that take place and, and you know, where they use stadiums as base operations. And I was trying to, I was thinking hard, like what movie did they have a sports stadium that wasn't used as a sports stadium? And so after thinking about it and just looking at my wall and trying to rethink the movie I came with, was the 1998 version of Godzilla. Because in that movie, you get towards the end, and if you haven't seen it, it sucks for you, but you get towards the end, and Godzilla has laid eggs. Mm -hmm. And these eggs, they're trying, they're searching the city. Where are these eggs? Where are these eggs? Well, the eggs, the home of these eggs, is Madison Square Garden. So Madison Square Garden becomes ground zero for the, the, the baby Godzillas. I mean, it's a Roland Emmerich flick. It's uh, 
you know, I like Roland Emmerich for the most part. I like Independence Day. I watch every year on Independence Day. It's, so it's not a movie I can watch all the time. I've only seen it a handful of times, but you know, I, I enjoyed it. Got that Godzilla for, for what it was. I, I appreciated it. Have you ever seen that version of Godzilla? I have. And I think with that one, I think it's more people didn't mind it at the time. People didn't love it at the time either, but people just kind of thought it was okay at the time. But now in hindsight, it, it seems worse, you know, <laughs> like especially compared to these, you know, couple Godzilla films that we've gotten in recent years, which kind of, you know, take it a little more seriously and closer to the source material and just, you know, a more Godzilla looking Godzilla. But um no, it's 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 not the worst movie I've ever seen. It's definitely good for the the Roland Emmerich disaster effect. It's a good disaster movie with stuff getting blown up and buildings getting destroyed and big giant scale monster just kind of wrecking things and just you know it's it's a, it's a popcorn blockbuster for that reason. Yeah, I mean I like I like the new Godzilla movies for the most part. I mean. The the second one, King of the Monsters. Mm. I've only ever I only saw it once in theaters. It, it was, you know, a way to kill a few hours. Not bad, not bad. But um, I mean, Godzilla versus Kong is supposed to come out soon. I'm I'm hopeful for that one. It's, it seems like it'll probably be pretty good. The special effects I can't imagine will be bad. So, and then who knows where they go from there. That be might Kong be the movie. end of it for now. They might reboot it again with Godzilla after Godzilla vs. Kong because Godzilla King of the Monsters didn't do super well at the box office, not as well as the studio had hoped. So it may just be depending on financially what Godzilla vs. Kong does. And again, that might be tough because you know we still might be looking at a post-COVID world where who knows what movie theaters are going to look like and how studios are going to really earn as much revenue as they did from before covid but i think depending on what godzilla versus kong does financially maybe we get a reboot maybe they just kind of continue it kind of making sequels or something so i guess we'll just have to wait and see yeah yeah, yeah. i mean they're not my favorite movies but they're like you said popcorn blockbusters not a bad way I mean, when movie theaters were around, I had my AMC Stubbs pass. I had 20 bucks a month. I could see whatever I wanted, so I'd just go see everything I could. So yeah. those are good good movies to kill a few hours. The good old days. You had the AMC Stubbs, which is a little more recent, but um, you know, I was on the, the movie pass train when that was popular, and that was that was great while it lasted. You know, unsustainable, but you know, great if you took advantage of it while it was around. So, you know. Good old days. Oh yeah, I had movie pass as well. <laughs> Ten bucks a month, thirty movies in a month. I mean, yeah, that's insane too. The thing with coronavirus, dude. Where I'm, I would go to the movies two, maybe three times a week. Now I haven't been to a movie. I saw Tenet. I saw that one. I, I risked it for Tenet. I risked it for Nolan. I'm a Nolan fanboy. What can I say? But I risked it, and, and ended up not being able to understand the movie because the sound was crap it's much better on the blu-ray but god but and besides yeah. that the last movies i saw in theaters was march i saw me and my friends we did a double feature of was it the hunt and bloodshot that stupid vin diesel movie those are the last movie again god 2020 sucked all right so the last story we're gonna wrap I'm gonna wrap up these stories on is from gold derby which i'm not sure if you're familiar with but gold derby is Essentially, they predict the award shows. They then they they give odds and everything for awards. And the category I was reading about was about the best supporting actress um, <clears throat> for the this year coming up. And uh, a lot of good supporting roles this year. A lot of there were you know even though movies were essentially gone this year, they still released some pretty good movies. There's a good slate of of, of movies that are going to be. Uh, going to be up for awards this year so i guess i'm going to launch right into the movie because i was wondering you know originally i was thinking all right we talked about last year's best supporting winner which was laura turn from marriage story good movie excellent performance but i wanted to go with this year somebody who's getting a lot of buzz and could potentially be a best supporting actress nominee which 
would be insane. I would love it. Is Maria Bakalova from Borat subsequent movie film. Mm -hmm. Because, holy crap, that movie. And she is phenomenal. Like, I remember when I finished watching that movie and I said, I said that I was talking to a buddy or whatever and, and we were talking, I said like, for her to come in, for somebody to come into a Borat movie, usually they come in and they're trying so hard to be equal to the main person or like the iconic character. Borat is an iconic character. And usually they fall short. It's, you can tell they're trying. But she came in and she would she outshined Borat in this movie. She was so good. So had, did you see Borat? Second one? I will say I didn't see either this one or the original Borat, but... Um... I feel like this is one of those nominations where you almost kind of hope this person wins it, but you know they're not going to. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going to give the best supporting actress to uh, uh, somebody from a comedy movie, unfortunately. They're going to give it to, you know, somebody who was in a really well-acted indie, you know, film that didn't really have a, a high budget or raking a lot of dollars or just was the epitome of artsy and just... You know, unfortunately, she probably won't win it. I kind of hope she does, you know, because it would just symbolize the the wacky year that 2020 was for movies. And and look, you're right. It's not like we didn't have no movies come out. There were still movies that did. But obviously, you're not looking at as many nominations from as many movies or like, you know, a, a bigger pool that you would have had in a pre-COVID world. So they kind of you know, went with some still really great performances, but from movies where people maybe had to look up some of these first to learn more about them. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think she's, she definitely isn't going to win, but I could, I, I get it for her. You know, there's a phrase being nominated is the win. And I think for her, it's her first movie. It's her first like big movie or whatever. So I think I could see her sneaking in, uh, as a nominee, especially I, 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 I'd say she's guaranteed a Golden Globe nomination because I, I'd, I'd put money on that that she'd get nominated for a Golden Globe. It'd be interesting to see if she pulls off a, a SAG award nomination. That's that, that'll be interesting. But um, she was just she was good, man. She was hilarious. The movie's hilarious. It's obviously political. I mean, took down Rudy Giuliani pretty good. <laughs> I mean, that guy didn't really need much help, but. Um, and I mean, the original movie came out and it was, it had a surprise nomination, Oscar nomination, where it was nominated for best, uh, screenplay, best adapted screenplay, which was pretty insane that it got a screenplay nomination considering the movie's essentially improv. So. And look, crazier things have happened at the Oscars. It's entirely possible that she can win and, you know, we'll have other, you know, wins just out of the blue this year. So every, it's always a possibility, you know, crazier things have happened with different winners in the past. So she could very well win this. Well, I think we have different, I think we have different thoughts on who can actually win. I don't think she stands a shot in hell in winning in winning the Oscar for it, but I, I think she stands a shot of being nominated. <laughs> that's, that's about as far as my, my moneymaker Vegas odds will give her. But she's somebody who I think will. Uh, she's a very extremely talented actress, and I, you can tell that this was a performance and a movie that's going to. You're going to see a lot of this chick. So I took the the obvious approach with this one. I went with the movie that the previous best supporting actress who won it won the Oscar was in last ceremonies, <laughs> and that was. Laura Dern, who won Best Supporting Actress, the Oscar for Marriage Story. And Marriage Story, you know, I finally saw this a few months back, you know, sometime during the pandemic. Time just all blends together. But, um, you know, it's a it's a very I, I would say it's almost kind of like room where it's a very personal, emotional human story. Like, you're not just going to watch this one on repeat over and over again for replayability. I'm sure if you like it, because it's very well done, you'll probably go back and watch it again if you liked it. But it's still, it's still just a very tough movie to watch. You almost kind of feel like an intruder just kind of watching this marriage fall apart between the two leads, between Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. And, 
you know, especially as a, as a child of divorce, you know, it kind of uh, hit home a little bit, but I think it was still, it was very well acted. You know, if you don't like the movie because of other reasons, you can't not like it. You can't say it wasn't well acted because it was very well acted, not only by Laura Dern, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, but by the other people as well. And not just the leads either, but people who played a part in this movie. I think everyone just did a really great job acting-wise in this one. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Laura Dern was who I voted for for the SAG Awards too. And, and um, I, I enjoyed the movie for what it was which was it's not a big flashy movie it's it's just a a movie and i you, you get to see phenomenal performances and I, I think you know a lot of people know adam driver now from star wars so they got to see him more in a you know more personal kind of role because he's been in some smaller movies like i don't know if you ever saw logan lucky it's a great movie but you know he's played smaller type roles but this one really broke out and i think when it came to it a lot of people were saying um the oscar for him would come down between him for marriage story and joaquin phoenix for joker obviously joaquin phoenix won one of the greatest performances ever i think um and uh i, I the one thing i did like around the time of this because the movie is based off of um noah Baumbach's real divorce from jennifer jason lee yep. And um, and and how tumultuous it got for them. And so one of the criticisms that was that came out with the movie was because um, he based Adam Driver on himself. And so Adam Driver, the character, is apparently this genius writer. And he's like the best writer in the world. And so I loved reading all the stories like, oh, Noah Baumbach, I really, really thinly veiled that one, huh, didn't you there, buddy? <laughs> so, uh, that was a pretty funny story. I like Noah Bomba. I don't know if you ever saw the Squid and the Whale in those movies. There, there. He, he makes one of the. He makes those good, low key kind of drama esque movies that are that are quirky almost. But man, the scene. So you just watched it recently, but yeah, the scene I think that that got those nominations was um, you had the yelling scene in the art in the apartment with Scarlett Johansson and him. Such a great scene. And if you're if you're a big online meme person at all, you've seen this scene kind of taken where people caption it different ways, but it's the one where Adam Driver kind of punches the wall of the apartment and leaves a little bit of dent there. And it's like, a, you know, a picture of him kind of pointing and yelling at Scarlett Johansson. So even if you haven't seen the movie, but you've seen that online, that's where that scene kind of comes from. Yeah. Yeah, and Laura Dern, because she played... She played a lawyer pretty good. She she was pretty despicable. In that <laughs> she movie, was man. she was tenacious in it. She she played you know this shark, this divorce lawyer, and you know she was she deservedly won the Oscar for it. She was great in it. She you know you you didn't want to mess with her in this. And she but she came across when she's first kind of introduced and she's talking with Scarlett Johansson's character. You know she just comes across as so nice and caring, but still kind of calculating but then you see her in action in court and it just you know she plays like this ruthless divorce lawyer and just does such a great job of doing it yeah and I, a lot of people said you know it was a cumulative oscar win for her because people like laura dern she's just been great for so long and i generally have a uh when it comes to children of of actors i generally you know, I'm going to say that they start a little lower for me because I don't believe that they, they, a great podcaster by the name of Ralph Garman has a phrase and it's uh, born on third, but think they hit a triple. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it doesn't apply to all because there, there are people who maybe were born on third, but they don't have the mentality that they hit the triple. If you follow the metaphor, yeah. Laura Dern is one of those. Laura Dern is, she maybe was born on third because her parent, uh, Bruce Dern, I mean, incredible actor. And, but she worked, she worked her butt off to get where she is. And she's a phenomenal actress. And, you know, I, there are plenty of people like that, you know, Ben Stiller, John David Washington, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, prominent actors now who are born from uh, famous parents, you know, they never worked at McDonald's, yeah. but they worked on their craft. So let's wrap things up here by talking about our new release movie of the week, and that is Wonder Woman 1984. 
And this one, it came out on Christmas, and this is our first episode, so you know we wanted to talk about it anyway. But but it's still kind of circulating in the news a little bit. And one of the latest kind of stories about that is that Warner Brothers submitted it for the Oscars to be nominated for awards it think thinks that it might earn. So I'll get your opinion on that in a second. But first, let's just let's just talk about the movie a little bit. And again, because it's so new. Let's try not to delve into spoilers here, but overall, what did you kind of think of the movie? It was okay. <laughs> Got nothing more to say. It was okay. In full disclosure, the first movie I thought was okay. This yeah. one I thought was okay. I don't hate it the way apparently the internet seems to. I don't love it the way some people seem to. I, it was two and a half hours that I killed and I'll probably watch it again whenever it comes out on 3D. Cause I think they're releasing the 3D soon, but you know, it was, it, it was okay. Yeah. I, I'm of the, the same opinion on this one. I know you and I differ about the first Wonder Woman. I think it was very good. The third act. Okay. But overall I thought it was a very good, very well done female superhero movie, but this one it was just okay. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I'm split down the middle like you, which apparently you're not allowed to do because it seems like everyone either loves this movie and is viciously defending it from the haters or you despise this movie and you think it was absolute garbage. <laughs> so I don't think either. I think it's, it's, it's good. It has good parts. It has bad parts. But, you know, I think maybe the people that are saying it's terrible is because it was a little bit of a disappointment. Because most people seem to like the first Wonder Woman and had high expectations for this one. And it just really didn't meet those for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the director, you got what, Patty Jenkins. So I, I actually very much like Patty Jenkins. I think she's a phenomenal director. She directed Charlize Theron to an Oscar for Monster. So yep. she's, a, she's a great director. And, and I like seeing her taking on these these movies inside. I mean, she just got, so after Wonder Woman came out, she's going to be doing the uh, Rogue Squadron Star Wars movie. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm happy that she's getting that success because I like her. Um, yeah, one of, I saw the first Wonder Woman in theaters. Um, I was one of those that came out of the theater before reading any internet or anything. It was like, oh, that was the female Captain America movie. And I, and I enjoyed it. But that's... Those were my thoughts. I was like, all right, it takes place in, you know, world wars. Uh, I think that one was World War II. First, Captain America was World War One, And, um, you know, I enjoyed it. I think Gal Gadot was really good. I think Chris Pine's really good. I enjoy the movie looked fantastic. I enjoyed watching it. I've seen it several times. So it is a good movie. And I appreciate the... I appreciate when people say that it's good for little girls to see a Wonder Woman, you know, just like people said it's good for little, you know, African-American children to see a Black Panther. And I relate that to myself. It was good for me as a child to see Chris Farley, you know, as a fat guy. It was good to see using fat as a way of funny. That helped me in my life. So I under I, I understand the importance of movies like that because they are – little girl see a superhero woman not just a girlfriend not just a wife superhero you know little african-americans see you know the superhero wakanda they see that they they they, they they're like oh my god that is awesome i am a superhero that is that's me on the screen so i fully appreciate that but if i just break away from those things and just take it as a movie i thought wonder woman one was was good i've seen it this one i thought was good seems like the internet like we already said Love the first one, despise the second one. I don't get that. Maybe you can talk more about that as to what was the difference in the first and the second that really saw the drop off for you. Um, like I said before, I think maybe people's expectations after the first one kind of contributed to not liking this one as much because it was a little bit of a letdown. It just wasn't maybe done as well. But I think part of it was without getting without discussing the movie too much without getting into spoiler territory the two and a half hour runtime it just it feels a little long there were there were definitely parts that they could have cut out 
and it wouldn't really have changed the final product that much. And I would say maybe the story just isn't quite as good as the first one. And again, without spoiling anything, but, you know, I think that kind of falls, not flat, not, not completely. It's still a good message that's getting across and it's still, you know, pl- some good action in there too, which is what you want out of a Wonder Woman movie, which is the action and that she inspires hope and all that kind of stuff. And, and this movie does that, but it just doesn't quite hit the same notes as the first one. But you know, what, what do you think about the performances from the actors in this one? Because you've already talked about Patty Jenkins, and I think she's a great director, too. Maybe this wasn't quite her best, but I still think she's definitely worth giving that, that Star Wars movie to, and that she'll kind of learn from this one and do a, a better job with Wonder Woman 3, which was recently announced. But, but what do you think about the performances in this one? Because... I thought despite some of the movie's drawbacks that no one really kind of didn't do a good job acting wise in this one. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, you, you know, Pedro Pascal, who's just amazing in everything I've ever seen him. I mean, game of Thrones, that dude was awesome. And he is the Mandalorian. So, um, you got Kristen Wiig, who's just, you know, an SNL legend. She's phenomenal. Um, the supporting people in that movie were, were solid. I mean, I, I mean, I can't say it, but there's, there wasn't a false note in the acting or anything. It was just, uh, um, yeah, I, like, I don't, I, I think it comes to, I liked it more than it seems you liked it because as you said, my expectations for it maybe weren't as high as people who thought the first one was as phenomenal people who thought the first one probably should have been nominated for best picture Oscar, which this movie ain't getting that nomination. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but you know, because again, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, but my opinion, at least the first wonder woman, the third act, it's, it's still a relatively new movie. So I won't talk about it that much for people who haven't seen it, or maybe they saw wonder woman 1984 come out and they're like, okay, I haven't seen either. I'm going to go back and watch both of them. So I won't spoil anything, but the third act for Wonder Woman, if that was, if they did that really well, then I say, I say it's up there with one of the the best female superhero movies of all time. And, and I know that's not saying much considering the, the competition out there, because unfortunately there really hasn't been that many great ones. You know, you look back at ones like Catwoman and Elektra and some of these other ones that just, not really hit the same bar but if they would have nailed the third act of the first wonder woman movie we'd be having a a totally different conversation you know it would just i think so much of the movie besides that just really does still does such a great job of portraying that female hero and that icon for little girls to look up to but you know this one um yeah it just it it didn't quite have the the same effect on me at least so thank you everybody for tuning in to our first episode here of Life Imitating Movies. So we'll be back again next week at the same time. If you're watching this on YouTube, the audio will be down in the description for the links to listen to just the audio versions of the podcast. And obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, do all the YouTube things down below. So thank you all for watching and hopefully you can tune in next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>